In 1984, a remarkable discovery forever changed our understanding of human evolution. The leaky team and ant an almost complete fossilized skeleton, dating back approximately 1.4 million years. This discovery, known as Trukana Boy, was a pivotal moment that placed Kenya's Lake Trukana Basin on global map as a cradle of mankind. Tukana boy is one of our iconic uh, uh, in spe specimens here in Kenya. It's one of the unique discoveries that makes Kenya not only the, uh, the, the presents Kenya as the ultimate home of human origins, because we know that our ancestors is where everything started. Tukana boy is the ancestor or the human being that actually moved out of Africa and populated out of, out of the world, and that's why we see or present Kenya as the ultimate home of human origins. So therefore, with that in mind, we see that uh, over time there's been different uh, biological, physical and uh, cultural changes that have happened through time. Biological in terms of our brains, our morphology, how we walk, how we do our, our teeth, there are different kind of biological changes that happen in our body. We, two, we also have different kind of uh, cultural changes that happen. Te technology, for example, when Tukana boy was there, we were using what we call hand access, very small rudimentary tools, but that has changed now. Technology is having now, we have smartphones, computers, that is something that was not there in the past. Since then, the National Museums of Kenya has become the custodian of the country's rich and diverse heritage. Within its walls lies the stories of our past, present, and the legacy we leave for future generations. However, the increasing frequency of extreme weather events due to climate change poses unprecedented threat to our cultural treasures. Climate change has become a paramount concern in the global management and conservation of cultural heritage, and Kenya is not exempted from these challenges. To address these challenges, the inaugural Joint International Scientific Conference, organized by the National Museums of Kenya in collaboration with the Association of Kenya Entomologists, is said to foster cross-disciplinary collaboration, advance professional development, facilitate policy dialogue, and engage communities in conservation efforts. The main functions of the directorate is uh, mainly to undertake research uh, to spearhead research, uh, conservation, uh, preservation of uh, biological uh, aspect. We have cultural and prehistoric uh, uh, flora and fauna. And uh, also the most important function is uh, it acts as a, a national repository for unique uh, uh, collections of the three aspects biological, cultural, and prehistoric materials. We also uh, do research so that we, uh, we help to inform uh, issues touching on climate ch uh, change, especially on matters, medication, and adaptation. How do we do that? Through our pre prehistoric research, where we collect like pollen, which have been uh, accumulated over time in wetlands, we are able to tell or know the climate for many years back in the past, like more than 500 or even, even a million years ago. So museum is very strong in helping to inform on climate change, uh, mitigation and adaptation. Many, many, many insects can be categorized as beneficial and what you call economic importance, in that they 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 demand uh, uh, they demand an attention in terms of management. Initially, we used to talk about control, but in the current trends, we talk about management. Managing in the sense that these insects, as much as they are harmful, they are not going anywhere. We have to live with them in a way that they don't cause any damage to the crops. And if there is then damage caused, then the damage should be kept under the economic injury level, below the economic injury level. So most of the insects have kind of also evolved from being uh, beneficial to harmful due to what you call the farmer practices. Farmers have been in, in practices that have been harmful to the beneficial insect that now have turned them to be harmful. By this I mean, uh, I'll, I'll give examples. Uh, 
in a natural world, in nature, the populations are able to control themselves. However, when a farmer goes in with a knapsack to spray pesticides on, on, on a field, on a, on a crop, the chemical does not specify which one to kill, which one to spare. So these are seen the reduction of the beneficial insect and the half size of the harmful insect. So that means farmers have to spend more resources, have to spend more money controlling now the pest in their farms. And the reason why we are focusing on butterflies is that uh, they play a key role in the environment as pollinators. Um, they've been recorded to pollinate various uh, uh, crops, including cotton, and as well as uh, uh, some of the mangrove species. And this is, is, this is very important because uh, without pollination, then the plants cannot regenerate. Without pollinators, then we cannot ensure food uh, security. Um, among the butterflies, uh, we also have um, other roles that they play in the ecosystem. Uh, they, they, are, they form part of the food chain. They are eaten by other creatures like the lizards and also other invertebrates like the spiders. So, so they help in sustaining the environment and biodiversity in general. We also have the moths and especially the hawk moths that are very key in pollination. And some of our uh, fruit trees, like the poppos, are pollinated by uh, hawk moths. And the most interesting part is that most of these hawk moths do their work in the evening, in the night, and very early in the morning. And it's very sad when people say that, uh, oh, don't uh, spray your crops during the day because the bees are at work. Uh, spray in the evening. They've not known that we also have pollinators, especially the moths that do their work at that time when they target to pollinate. In the sense that this information is used for environmental protection and conservation of our biological uh, capital, which is our biological diversity. For example, we have at the coast next to Arabuko Sokoke Forest, the Kipepeo project. Here the communities rear butterflies or farm butterflies. They sell the pupil stages and they get income. Mostly we are concerned about the conservation and management of wetlands, but that does not mean we restrict people on their use, but we promote wise use. We realize that Kenya is a signatory to the Ramsar Convention, where it is obliged to take care of the wetlands, promote wise use, and since it appeared to that convention, we have six Ramsar sites in Kenya, most of them are in the Rift Valley Lakes, and we have the sixth one, the Tana Delta. And that makes us answerable to the international community as far as wetlands conservation is concerned. But I would like to state that the Ramsar, the, the, the Ramsar sites, they are already overcrowded by the many other conventions that take care of them because some of them are heritage sites, like the ones in the Rift Valley. Some double up also as in convention of migratory species. You can see the, the interrelation between the ecosystem, the effect of any change, that mo and most of those changes are driven by man, man-made. If you come closer home, you think of Nairobi River, you see what we are seeing. And mostly it's because maybe people have overlooked the need to plan, the need to own the process of environmental conservation. Because if you were to think about that's in Nairobi River, if all this business community, the CBD, and I think they should here, if they adopted the frontage and take care of it, and also take care of what they discharge in the river system, I mean, we would make steps towards its conservation. Many efforts have been there, back and forth, but I think the results are questionable, you know. And when we think about the communities, like when you think of the source, like um, the Gong Hills, the Krarapong, and the, it's the source of Bagadi River. If you go up there and let the community know that we need this source, I'm sure they will do the trees around the, the source. They will not farm so close to the 
the refer the springs bank so in whole that's what i'm saying that if we let people know the need to do something rather than take a, a kiboko and tell them this is the way people had a culture of what to do when i want to pick about like the pastoral communities who are mostly about 70 percent of the kenya is asile and those people they knew like let's say the maasai they know when to graze where that's a way of conserving yes. because during the rainy season they kept away from the wetlands mm -hmm. because they know the wetlands are the refuge for the dry season you see that is the indigenous knowledge they knew which tree not to cut especially among the kikuyu the fig tree you know so um and they had the the, the importance of wetlands were tagged to a story you know and that kept that wetland on it's being safeguarded by the continuity of that story. Like among the Luya and their, in their rites of passage, their wetlands where the in-sheets go to bathe, you know, that will make them conserve. So I would want to say that traditionally each community had a way of conserving, you know. And that is why even when we go out in the field to do research, you do not overlook the local communities. They are the ones who will guide you and tell you this used to be like this and it's no longer that. And what did they used to do? The rising sea levels, the rising water temperatures all have a very negative impacts to the fish species, meaning that the fishes will change the ecological uh, niches where they live. Yeah, because we have fishes limited to uh, different uh, temperature needs. Uh, once they rise, then it means that th those fishes have to move to areas where they are comfortable living. We have many fishes that actually, we can't say that they are extinct, but we have many that are categorized in different uh, categories according to IUCN levels and CITES levels actually. We have fishes that are critically endangered. In Kenya we have many actually, some that inhabitant Lake Victoria, uh, one of them is Labio Victorianas. Actually, some of these were wiped out because of uh, the introduction of the Nile patch. So, b because Nile patch is highly carnivorous and actually you fend on the young ones of these others. So, you find some of these in patchy areas of other rivers upstream, um, but in very small quantities. So, the, the abundances are low. So that's why we say they are critically endangered because they are confined to specific areas of the rivers. We have those others, others that, that are endangered, others vulnerable. Yeah, many are of, of least concern because there are, there are many out there. Yeah, um, some of the very important collections that we have in ichthyology, uh, such like the, the silacanth. The, the silicanth has only one specimen in Kenya, actually, caught in 2001 off Malindi. Uh, it was caught as a bycatch. Bycatch means it was not intended, it was not targeted. So it came out together with the other catches from the, the trawlers. So when this fish was caught, actually it looked very unique even to the fishermen. And they, they thought to keep it. Actually, in most cases, by catches are thrown back into the, the waters. But for this particular one, because of its uniqueness, they retained it. And they handed it over to fisheries offices in Malindi. And actually, like six months later, the, the, the Mombasa Agricultural Show was on, and they dis decided to exhibit it. So by then, President Moy was the, our president in 2001. And he came across it actually during his tours of the show and he thought that that was something very unique. So he owned and uh, 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 for that sp specimen to be pres preserved by the museum as a national heritage. So that's how it ended up here. So we only have one specimen in Kenya of the silicon. And uh, important to note is that the silicon was actually extinct 400 million years ago. Um, but was rediscovered again in South Africa. 
at the museums in the department, we are doing uh, botanical research, uh, various aspects of uh, botanical science. And one of the areas that we are looking at is issues of climate change and more so on invasive species. So over the years, we have conducted field investigations in various parts of the country and outside and across Africa, um, looking at the invasive species, um, the impact of invasive species, how they come to be, and what damage or what extent they have affected the general biodiversity. So one of the places that we have looked at the invasive species is uh, North Central Kenya up in Laikipia where we have one of the um, uh, invasive species, uh, uh, Opundia ficus indica, uh, which has literally taken over the savannas in terms of the fodder and, and, and the rangelands. And we have also uh, worked in, down at Kilivi in Kenya's coast. Uh, we have uh, looked at invasives uh, such as Randana Kamara, Sinda Ovata, uh, among others. And of course we have worked on the water hyacinth, a very common known uh, uh, invasive in fresh waters, uh, for example Lake Victoria and uh, Naivasha, Lake Naivasha among other fresh water bodies which is also problematic. And we have also had a look, uh, we know also of course about the famous Madenge, uh, very common in uh, Central Rift Valley um, Baringo County as well as north coast up to north which is also very problematic. So in general uh, 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 we are witnessing more and more um, invasion by these plants we refer to as invasive species from the word invading. So that means they, they get to places they are not supposed to be. One of the striking characters or they are very characteristic in that they have very adaptive they are resilient and they are very competitive and that's why they age out the native species or those plants originally growing in their habitats and they have the capacity to colonize. So one of the things we have found in our work is that uh, the species diversity gets reduced where they grow because they take over and colonize. Now most of these invasives actually they may have a little, little use but most of them are not useful in any way in terms of biodiversity and they have affected even livelihoods. For instance, you know about the uh, Madenge um, that they will take most of the fodder area where, you know, herders, those who keep livestock would be, you know, taking care of livestock and they'll take all that other than the damage also they do. And also invasives also, they have capacity to really destroy ecosystems and the quality of life, denying people ecosystem services. So recently we were doing some work in Kilivi County in restoration sites and we were assessing the extent to which invasives have taken over and in some places we found that uh, some invasives have taken 40% of the total cover of the land, which means no other plant species uh, will grow there. And other than that also, they take over and some can become even weeds, affecting agriculture and productivity. And we have also learned that uh, invasives are hard to control, they are not easy. Each invasive species requires a different way of getting rid of it. For some, it may be mechanical, and we are still doing some studies trying to find out what other options are there to control invasive species. So at back in the herbarium, in the museums, we have collections of invasive species and we keep them here also for reference and also for those who may be interested in studying invasive species. And it is also a reference uh, center for farmers, uh, for people doing agriculture, um, uh, keeping livestock, and those who want to know more about the behavior of uh, invasive species. First, we need to understand that uh, it's all about the climate change. So what is happening is that we, are, we humans, are interfering with ecosystems. And in turn, for example, we are releasing a lot of greenhouse gases. So it means that we are going to have global uh, temperatures rising, and this destabilizes the ecosystem in a way. So what happens is that as we continue, for example, cutting trees, uh, cutting trees and 
having, you know, areas that were previously forest turn bare and exposed to soil erosion, uh, invasive species now takes advantage. So one of the things we have to do is to stop destroying forest, to stop killing plants, to stop removing plants. Because every time we expose uh, forests uh, to soil erosion, now we allow the invasive species to take over. So one of the things actually is to make sure that we are not cutting trees. And the other thing is to make sure that we reafforestate or we plant more trees in areas that are occupied by the invasive species. And sometimes I know of places where people have literally uprooted or removed them and then they replace them with indigenous uh, plant trees. So that way you can also now mitigate the impacts of invasive species. We also know that invasive species also spread faster and they may be spread by weed, by animals, depending on whichever dispersal method they be. So one of the ways is to see how we can stop or we can slow down the dispersal and to avoid more spreading. Within this conference, there's going to encompass uh, panel discussions, uh, symposium. We're going to have uh, post-conference workshops for, to empower young researchers. We're also going to have excursions also within uh, other museum sites. For example, uh, one of our major prehistoric sites in Logisaile, uh, current Blixen Museum, and also our own museum at the Nairobi Gallery. Uh, we'll also have uh, different themes that are going to be discussed that include uh, climate change, topics in climate change will be discussed during the conference. Uh, we'll also have topics in relation to indigenous knowledge systems because we value uh, knowledge that is uh, held by our indigenous communities and how we can align this with our own scientific uh, information. We're also going to discuss uh, issues related to technologies in biodiversity. As we move towards digital world, in science we are also trying to move from analog to digital technologies where we encompass uh, we, uh, where we employ uh, technologies like drones to collect data. Uh, we also employ uh, satellite, uh, collecting data using satellite imageries, and we also use uh, different applications that help us to uh, collect data and also share this data so that uh, this data is accessible to the various technology, uh, I mean scientists and the various experts who are, want to use them. Within the conference also, uh, we've invited a number of delegates, about 300 delegates that we expect to host during this particular time. And among them are also uh, international delegates. And one of the key ones is uh, Professor uh, Beverly Glover, is a professor in uh, plant systematics. So he's going to be part of the conference. As we face the challenges of the modern era, the preservation of our cultural heritage stands as a testament to our past, a gift to the present, and a responsibility for the future. For Culture Quest, I'm Levis Msumba.